Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our study this morning. This is lesson 10 of our study on the search for the Christian spiritual life. We have gone through our introduction. We've gone through looking at God's words, the words that God has used uh, in the first chapter and the first uh, 10 verses of chapter 2. And at that point, I decided it was time for a practical application uh, series. And so we began last week with a practical application series uh, entitled Reckoning, uh, how we understand and how we can uh, follow the edicts of the book of Ephesians to put off the old man and put on the new man by reckoning the, uh, the old man to be dead and reckoning ourselves alive to Christ. The lesson today will be about temptation, uh, what temptation is, how temptation works, the mechanics of temptation, and then we'll look at the original temptation in the Bible from Genesis chapter 3. If you have uh, everything ready, we'll go ahead and begin. Let me move the camera a little bit so that I'll uh, be in it. Okay, good. And so let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful that you have offered us spiritual insight into your word, into your eternal purpose, the new body of Christ that we have the pleasure and honor to belong to through our faith in him, according to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We thank you for the wisdom that you give us and we ask that that wisdom become real to us as we study it this morning. And we ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, let's see what works next. This is again our practical application from Ephesians 1 and 2. And we shall utilize Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 as our insight, as our introduction to our study. And I will be right there. To read that to you as soon as I get another device here. And this one. Will leave and this one will come into play. All right. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you being dead with reference to your trespasses and sins, he made a lie. In the sphere of which trespasses and sins, at one time you ordered your behavior as dominated by the spirit of the age in this world system, as dominated by the leader of the authority of the lower atmosphere, the source also of the spirit that is now operating in the sons of the disobedience, among whom also we all ordered our behavior in the sphere of the cravings of our evil nature, continually practicing the desires of our evil nature and of our thoughts, and we're continually children of wrath by nature, as also the rest. And then uh, we had our verse to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. Uh, it is the gift of God, and you don't have that page uh, that got lost in the shuffle there. Uh, and uh, then into verse 10, where it says, For we are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus with a view to good works, which God prepared beforehand, in order that within their sphere we may order our behavior. So you notice a couple of things here. God created these, uh, cre created us in Christ Jesus. 
We are his handiwork uh, with the view to good works that he prepared beforehand. So he created us in Christ Jesus. He prepared the works and uh, that uh, we then may order our behavior. So that's where our choice comes in. We have a choice in the matter, and that's to choose to order our behavior according to what uh, God has provided for us in the divine dynasphere, in the, the life power system that God has given to us as members of the body of Christ. So what happens to us, though, in that walk, in that life? Well, Ephesians, I'm sorry, Romans 7.15 gives us a good example. For what frequently works its way out of me surprises me, because what I resolve to do, these things I am not continually practicing, but what I detest, these things I repeatedly do. This is a corrected translation, so I can't give you the original. Um, I think the original says, for what I, for, for what I do surprises me because what I want to do, these things I do not do, but what I don't want to do, these things I do. And uh, so this is the, the uh, corrected translation. It's uh, what frequently works its way out of me. Uh, that is a kader godzomai. It's a, it's a word that means something on the inside working its way out. That's not kader godzomai. <laughs> I used the wrong word. Uh, it, it's something that works its way out of me, surprises me, and uh, he resolves to do the right thing, but he's not continually practicing them. But the things that he doesn't want to do, the things that he detests, repeatedly happen. And that's the story of our lives. It is a surprise to us when some things work their way out of them, out of us, but we don't want to do them, but they just keep happening, and especially when we're driving in traffic is when they seem to happen the most. Okay, uh, then let's go to Romans 6 for a further introduction. What then shall we say? Shall we continue in the sin that grace may abound? This is Young's Living Translation, for those who would like to know. Shall we continue in the sin that the grace may abound? Let it not be. We who died to the sin, how shall we still live in it? This knowing, and I've, I have skipped a bit here to leave out verses so that we would just cover the ones that are pertinent to what we're studying. Uh, this knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of the sin may be made useless. For our no longer serving the sin. For he who has died has been set free from sin. Then on down to verse 11. So also you reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to the sin and living to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not then the sin reign in your mortal body to obey it in its desires. So we have... Uh, excerpted from this passage, uh, several truths that shall give us good insight into what happens. First of all, uh, Paul has just expounded the, the wonders of grace, and then he says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because where sin abounded, grace much more abounded, overabounded. And so he asks, shall we continue in the sin that grace may abound? Well, of course not, he says, let it not be. We who died to sin, how shall we live in it? So the question immediately arises, how did we die to sin? And then verse 6 tells us, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin may be made useless for our no longer serving the sin nature. For he who has died has been set free from the sin nature. Those who die no longer have a sin nature, and the reason for that is very simple. The sin nature resides in the body, so when a person dies and their soul goes to wherever it is bound to go, there is no sin nature with it, so it's you're set free from the sin nature. 
then um, another problem with the uh, electricity having gone out, things are popping up here. Let's get rid of that. Okay, get rid of it that way. So uh, then he gives us what we covered last week in verse 11, so also you reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to the sin nature and living to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. And then the command, the edict, let not then the sin nature reign in your mortal body to obey it in its desires. And we covered desires last week, and we'll cover them again this week as we get to the appropriate point in our study. He continues on here in Romans 6, neither present you your members instruments of unrighteousness to the sin nature, servants you are to him to whom you obey. All right, let's start at the beginning again. Neither present you your members instruments of unrighteousness to the sin nature, but present yourselves to God. Have you not known that to whom you present yourselves servants for obedience, servants you are to him to whom you obey? So initially when I read it, I left out part of it. It said, neither present you your members instruments of unrighteousness to the sin nature, servants you are to him to whom you obey. You get to choose who you obey. And this goes back to the uh, time period in which uh, Paul wrote this. Slaves, servants, who were sold into slavery because they owed money or because they were captured uh, during war or uh, whatever the circumstances were, they became servants or slaves to their master. When they had completed their servitude, their, the terms of their servitude, whether it be uh, a year or 10 years or 20 years, whatever it happened to be, when they completed that term of servitude, they could then be free. They were free and they had papers that uh, stated that they were free. And I think you'll see somewhat in your studies of the uh, scriptures, uh, they called them freedmen. And uh, those freedmen uh, were made up a big part of Ro Roman citizenry because many of the slaves had been very intelligent, very uh, accomplished people before they had gone into slavery, either through captivity or a, a bad uh, a bad business venture that put them into debt. So they were then indentured to the person that they owed the money. But when everything was paid off and when, this, when the process was completed, they had their freedom. Well, many of these people, slaves, had a good life in their slavery and they chose to remain slaves to that person. They did not want to go free and go out and start their life over again maybe because of their age, maybe because of the circumstances, maybe because of the uh, economy of the time, whatever it happened to be, they could choose to remain with the slave owner uh, by their choice. And that's what Paul is referencing here. You uh, have been set free, but you can still go back to the old slave master and choose to serve that slave master. So uh, he concludes here in this passage, so now present your members servants to the righteousness. And that righteousness is the righteousness that we receive uh, in our salvation. We not only received, let me go ahead and do it this way. This is uh, perfect righteousness plus R and it comes down through a pipeline to us. And this is our, remember our sanctification? Uh, we talked about it. That was strange. 
Uh, we talked about it being positional. That's how God sees us when he looks upon us in uh, the first uh, few verses of chapter 1, where he has chosen us to be perfect and blameless in his sight. Okay? That's our position, that we, are, we have the perfect righteousness that comes from imputation. So on this side, I'm going to write imputation. Okay? So on this side, we have the imputation of perfect righteousness. So we have that. Okay? That's the ye uh, in the translation, the King James translation. Ye meaning you all, or the way it's properly spelled is y'all. Y'all have perfect righteousness imputed to you so that in the sight of God, you are perfect and without blame. But one that's the one that I have found is uh, almost universally overlooked is that we have imparted righteousness as well. And so we have that plus R in us also. And we have access to that righteousness. That's why we are able to follow these commands. Present yourself servants to the righteousness, the imparted righteousness. I have a study, I believe it's uh, at least part of it is on YouTube, on the YouTube channel called the Reservoir of Righteousness. Reservoir of Righteousness. And it's like a, I pictured it, I, I would suppose that the images would show up on the study uh, as, a, as a reservoir, a huge lake uh, that is being held back by a dam. Uh, and that dam, of course, can be turned on so that the water can flow through and turned off so that the water will not flow through. Well, that's the way our reservoir of righteousness works inside of us. We choose to turn it on through counting our, reckoning ourselves to be dead to the sinful nature uh, and then choosing the righteous life. And I'll go into a more detailed study of that later in a, maybe not the next practical lesson, but the one after that, where we'll see the mechanics of doing the reservoir of righteousness uh, of our imparted righteousness that we have to be able to live this life. Uh, our next, our study today will be about how to avoid walking in the old man. And then next time, uh, or the time after, we'll, well, next time, we'll start to see how we walk in the righteousness. And then the reservoir of righteousness may, may come up next time or the time after. So we're going to see that. But the one you present yourselves to be servants to obedience, that's who you will obey. And so we want to choose to obey. So this is also a choice thing. This is also the volitional choice that we all have that we can choose it because the old nature is going to say, hey, how about doing this? And the Holy Spirit is going to say, uh, in that reservoir of righteousness, you've got this as an alternative for that. Choose it. And so we then get to choose. So there's always a choice. Now, what happens if you aren't aware of what is contained in your reservoir of righteousness? What's the Holy Spirit going to, uh, going to remind you of? Nothing, because you don't have it there. That's why the first chapter of Ephesians was so much about knowing the spiritual insight, the wisdom, the, the prudence, all of those things that Paul, and then Paul prays for us that, that we will know what we have, the height and the depth and 
and we have all of the knowledge base that, that he prays that we will understand. Why? Well, because the Holy Spirit cannot remind us of it so that we can choose it if we don't know it. If we don't know what the Word of God says, you cannot live what the Word of God teaches. So we have to understand it. All right, so we're going to look at the 10 Steps to Temptation. Uh, this is a study that I came up with, golly, 2004, 2008, some point in time. I uh, discovered this when I was studying uh, James chapter 1 on temptation. And I found uh, that if I went through all of the things that happened with Eve in the garden, uh, that it followed the, the uh, exact pattern of temptation that we go through. And so I began that study. So here's, here's the James chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. And uh, it begins thusly, let no one say, when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. In the original it says, he is untemptable. He is untemptable, and he does not tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. So we're going to look at verses 14 and 15 and see the mechanics of temptation. We're going to have to go back to the original Greek because the translators uh, typically have no concept of, of pregnancy and how that works. So uh, uh, we have to go back to the original Greek because in the book of James, you have a beautiful uh, description of how that process works. So let's look at it. James 1.14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away by his own lust and enticed. The word for each one is hekastos. Hekastas. And hekastas means each individual. Okay. Each individual is tempted. Okay. And is tempted is peirazo. Peirazo is one of two words for tempting uh, that are commonly translated tempting in the Bible. Um, there's a uh, I think it's perasmos and perazo. Um, can't remember the other one for sure. I think it's, I think it might be perasmos. Uh, anyway, um, perazo is the one that is a solicitation to do evil. Okay. Remember, we go through testing in our spiritual lives. That's that's not a solicitation to do evil. It is a testing to prove the good of what we do. That word, which I hopefully will come to me here shortly, uh, is the word that we would use if we were going to uh, assay gold to find out the purity of the gold. It's not to find out that it's not gold. It's to find out the purity of the gold. That's, a, that's part of our testing in our spiritual life, testing the gold, we'll say, uh, of our reservoir of righteousness, what we have in us to be able to live the life that God has for us. But this is the word peirazo, which means to solicit to do evil. And notice that it is a present passive indicative. Present tense means that it's ongoing action. It's continuous, continuous action. Passive voice means you receive it. passive voice, well, let's go ahead and spell it out, means that it's something you receive. Okay? Passive voice. You receive temptation. 
Indicative mood means it's a real thing. It really does happen. Okay? So you really do receive a solicitation to do evil. Well, when does this happen? Well, it's when he is carried away. And this is the word edzelko. And edzelko is the word for towing, pulling. Uh, in the uh, harbors, when the boats would come in, uh, they would throw the lines to the people on shore, to the workers on shore, and they would pull the boat on into the dock because they couldn't steer it uh, at, uh, accurately without a motor. And almost nobody back in the first century had a motor on their boat. So they couldn't steer it, so somebody had to tow it into where it belonged. So that's the word edzelko, and it means to be towed or pulled. And then the next word is a simple little word, by. That little word by right there is a key to understanding. In the Greek, that word is hupo. And you'll recall from our study before that hupo uh, is similar to kata, which uh, kata means under the authority of, coming down under the authority of, and hupo is a little different word, but it basically means the same thing, practically, under the authority of, under the authority of. So, you are towed under an authority. It's your personal or individual authority, as seen in the next word, idios. Right? Idios means your own, his own uh, idios, his personal or his individual. Okay. Notice how all of this has that repeated concept of individual, personal. You, we all have our own. And what is that? His own individual desire. And desire is epithumia. And epithumia is a lust pattern, a a pattern that you have inside of you, inside of your sinful nature, your inherited, inherited genetic human nature from Adam, okay? Almost an iguana, okay? It's your igna. It's your I guess we did a GH, we could call it the IFNA. GH as in cough. Uh, but that's your inherited genetic human nature from Adam. And I like to use that term for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the idea, concept of sin uh, to a lot of people immediately brands you as a Bible thumper, uh, hellfire and damnation, legalistic uh, Christian. And, uh, but when you put it in uh, terms that are more scientific and descriptive, uh, then, uh, they say, oh, what is that? What do you mean inherited, genetic, human nature? Oh, human, I know what human nature is, and then where's this Adam come? So people will talk about that where if you say your sin nature, they immediately turn you off because they say, yeah, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Okay? So... Your uh, epithumia uh, lust pattern, uh, I'm going to add a slide so we can look at that. Yeah, let's do that. And we're going to look briefly at this later, uh, very briefly. We're going to cover it in more detail in another week or two. That's the six-sided you. That's a sixagon, okay? And uh, that has, on its six sides, it has these letters to represent the lust patterns of the sinful nature. These are the desire patterns of the sinful nature. I call them 
the uh, human or happiness motivators. The human motivators of our sinful nature, of our inherited genetic human nature of Adam. Every human being in whatever culture you choose to study has these six. Some are more dominant in some cultures, some more uh, dominant in others, but they all have these same six human motivators. I know because I checked. I didn't go travel all those places. I looked them up in books. Okay. So this one is chemical. Chemical. Drugs, alcohol, Cheetos, uh, uh, foods uh, and beverages and uh, other items that make your flesh feel good. Make your flesh feel good. Make your body feel good. Okay? And, and that even includes such things as running long distances. Running long distances. That gives people a runner's high and makes them feel good. And some people are so addicted to that that they can't stop it. And then you also have the adrenaline junkies who have to do things that are dangerous all the time in order to have that shot of adrenaline to make them feel good. So a lot of different ways that chemicals work. This one is religious. Okay? Religious. Uh, it's probably the key motivator in everyone. Now you'll say, well, not everybody's religious. Well, I use religious uh, because religion is a belief system. You could call it philosophy. You could call it philosophy. But I already have a P down here, so I couldn't call it philosophy, so I called it religion. Okay? Uh, religion is man's attempt to please God or excuse himself from it. Okay? Man's attempt to please God or excuse himself from pleasing God. And it takes all forms. There are good religions. There are Mother Teresa's. And then there are Osama bin Laden's. There are uh, good religions that have a belief system that you should do good. That that's, that's how you get to heaven uh, is by doing good. And then you have other belief systems that you must kill the infidels in order to get to heaven. So uh, there's a, a good side and a bad side to each one of these. There's a, a good side and there's a bad side. Okay. Uh, the A is for approbation. Approbation, uh, you can think of simply, if you're unfamiliar with the word, approval. Approval. And approbation goes all the way from being liked Loved, admired, could have put appreciated in there. Uh, let's put it here, appreciated. And all the way down to uh, worship. <laughs> My screen keeps... Uh, changing there. Liked, loved, admired, appreciated, or worshipped. And there are other steps after appreciated, but uh, the liked part, that's my, that's my Sally Fields, uh, this is my Sally Fields uh, back in the days when I watched such things on television what some kind of Emmys, Oscars, Oscars. Oscar Awards, uh, she received an Oscar for something she did. And she came up on stage and she clutched her little uh, trophy, her little 
Oscar, what, okay, her Oscar. Um, and she cried her eyes out, and all she could say was, you like me, you like me, you really like me, because her peers had voted her this Oscar. That, that liked, loved, admired, appreciated, uh, idolized, that's the one that goes in here. Sorry for my screen changing here. Idolized, that, you'll find that often in performers in performers, and it's why you'll oftentimes see performers commit suicide, because when they are no longer idolized, admired, their life comes tumbling down, and they commit suicide because of it. It happened here recently to several uh, performers in uh, the last, uh, well, since I've been noticing it in the last uh, few months. Uh, I had a uh, put the positive inside. Had uh, an aunt, actually a cousin, who, when someone in the family died, she was Johnny on the spot. She was right there. She organized everything, the dinners and and everything, you know, and and that was her way of serving in order to be appreciated, in order to be appreciated. And uh, that's often the case as well. We'll get into that when we get into more specific examples of approbation motivation. Then we have the M for materialism. And uh, you all know what that is. That's the love of money or the love that uh, for the things that money can buy. and. Uh, establishing our feeling of worth based on what we have. Uh, you'll see that a lot uh, in the business world and people who want to impress you with their material possessions. And then power. Power is, uh, let's go down here and do it this way so I can get it that way. Power is, uh, we see it quite often in people control. They want to control. They want to control their environment. They want to control their possessions. They want to control the people around them. Uh, they want to control other people. So this is more uh, what you find in politics. Politics is a good venue for power. You also see it in, uh, in criminal behavior, um, gangs, that's the negative side of the power thing is, is gangs. Uh, in order to be a member of a gang, you have to uh, submit to the authority of the leader of that gang. And then we have this one uh, called sex and sexual happiness. Uh, you see a lot of people who have this, and it has a good side and a bad side. And uh, it even has bad sides that look like good sides. People who are crusaders against the kind of sex that they don't approve of. So they crusade against it. Uh, but you have, you have people who are adulterers. And you have people who are homosexuals. You have people who are uh, prudes, who, who don't think anybody should ever have sex, and uh, that it's dirty, nasty kind of thing. Um, and uh, so you'll see all kinds of ramifications for that sexual motivator uh, for happiness. So those are, are the basic lust patterns. And then everything else will fit inside of those. And we all have all of them, uh, but we have them in different degrees. And we have usually one or two dominant. And then we have others that are uh, less apparent in our lives. And we often judge people. 
uh, the people who are the judges, and those would be the ones with the religious motivation and the power motivation and somewhat the uh, approbation motivation, will judge people who don't have the same lust patterns uh, and their lust, your lust pattern is bad, okay? My, my uh, lust pattern, I prefer to call a, a happiness pattern because uh, it's a good one, okay? Uh, so uh, judgment, judgmentalism comes into play there. All right, so let's get back to this slide that we were just on. And we were all the way down to the last word here, uh, enticed. Enti enticed is deliazo, and deliazo is the word for baiting a trap, putting bait in a trap. Okay. So, now that I have distracted your flow of attention, let's see if we can get it back. So if we extract the most basic elements, we see that our personal desire plus bait equals temptation. However, we must not miss the fact that it is the authority of the personal desire that is towing us along toward the bait. Remember the word hoopo? Hoopo, under the authority of the personal desire that is towing us along toward the bait. That authority of the desire is the key to understanding sin, the walk in the flesh. Let us look at the very first temptation and see how it works. The 10 steps to temptation, the first sin in Genesis 3, 1 through 6. First, let's see what God said in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, from Young's literal translation, we see that God said this to Adam. And Jehovah God takes the man and causes him to rest in the Garden of Eden, to serve it and to keep it. And Jehovah God lays a charge on the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden eating thou dost eat, and of the tree of knowledge of good and evil Thou dost not eat of it, for in the day of thine eating of it, dying thou dost die. Dying you shall die. Well, wait a minute. That's not what my Bible says. I've looked at all kinds of translations, and uh, that's, that's not what most Bible says. This is what most Bibles say. And the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat from it. For in the day that you eat thereof thou shalt surely die. Surely die. So we had previously from Young's Literal, uh, Dying you do die. And this one we have, surely die. Well, let's, why does the Young's literal translation say, dying thou dost die? And other translations say, thou shalt surely die. Well, the reason for that is, as usual, poor translation. Failure to expand the translation or the failure to put the translation in context. Here is the Hebrew, uh, not the actual Hebrew letters, but what the Hebrew said. Uh, the Hebrew words in verse 17, there are two words. One is muth, and the other is tamuth. Both from the same root word, muth, both mean die. So, if we were to straight translate the Hebrew, it's, it would be, in the day you eat, die, die. Well, we've got to look at those two words. The first die here is the Cal infinitive absolute, and it's used to define more accurately or strengthen the idea of a verb. So notice it's a uh, Cal infinitive absolute, okay? And it has two usages in the Hebrew, that, that grammatical structure. It's to define more accurately 
or strengthen the idea. Okay? Define more accurately or strengthen the idea. More accurately define, strengthen the idea. Uh, we would say to stress, put stress on it or to emphasize it. Okay? So those are the two uses of the Cal infinitive. And the first word die here is a Cal infinitive mut. Okay. The second die is the imperfect form of the same word. Perhaps I didn't bring that out real well. Uh, you can see muth and tamuth. See how similar they are here? They are the same word. They're just different verb forms of uh, the same root word. It's different forms of the same word. Okay. The second die is the imperfect form of the same word. The imperfect denotes the beginning, the uh, unfinished, the continuing, that which is just happening. That which is just happening, uh, which is conceived as in a uh, process of coming to pass, the process of coming to pass. And hence also that which is yet future. This is from Gesenius's Hebrew Grammar, page 125. Okay. So the way we would translate Tamuth here is begin to die or begin the process of dying. Okay. So when we, we see that the translators of most English versions have chosen the strengthened use of the infinitive. Strengthened use of the infinitive would be surely. Because the following word is die, so so it's you, uh, the, the word with it is die. So to strengthen that, it's you're really going to die. Okay? You're surely going to die. That's why they said that. The strengthen. Surely. All right. While the Young's literal translation chose the define more accurately usage. Okay. Define more accurately, usage would be begin to, to begin to die. Okay. The question becomes, why did Dr. Young choose this? Well, the obvious answer is that we know that Adam and Isha lived for centuries after this. Genesis 5 Five says, altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years, and then he died. Well, that doesn't comport well with the strengthening usage. Therefore, we have dying, emphasized dying. You will begin the process of dying. Okay, So dying, you will die in the future. Dying, you will begin the process of dying. And so we've got to find out, well, what's, what's dying mean here? If it means dying, you will begin the process of dying. What's the first dying? So how do we explain the meaning of dying, you will die? Well, by seeing the context. We note that they immediately separated themselves from God. They ran and hid. Okay. This is the first act of religion. And it is first church of fig leaves. Okay. This is the first church of fig leaves. First two members, Adam and Eve, uh, Isha and Isha, uh, they were the first members of the first church of fig leaves. They ran off and hid from God. So what kind of death do we know about in the Bible 
that would relate to that hiding? Well, obviously we know that spiritual death is separation from God. Separation from God. So based on the context and subsequent history, along with what we learn in Romans, we can understand the true import and meaning of the verse. This is what Romans 5 says. Because of this, even as through one man, the sin did enter into the world, and through the sin, the death, and thus to all men, the death did pass through, for that all did sin. For till law, sin was in the world, and sin is not reckoned when there is not law. But the death did reign from Adam till Moses, even upon those not having sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression, who is a type of him who is coming. Okay, So we see here that the death entered in and uh, to all men, to all men, the death did pass through. Okay? To all men, the death did pass through. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because we could spend six or eight weeks on, on this one passage learning all about the sinful nature, the inherited genetic human nature of Adam. Okay? That's the sin. Okay? The sin. I G H N A. All right. When Adam ate, he had a chromosome called the Y chromosome. And somewhere in God's divine wisdom, purpose, and plan, on that chromosome is a gene, uh, some sort of a place where the sinful nature death is located. And that is passed down by the man to his offspring. Okay. And that death then does pass through. For that all did sin, and this throws a lot of people off this section, but that means that in the, in the construction of the Greek for that all did sin when uh, Adam sinned. Okay? We all sinned in Adam. He was the head. And we'll see that later in Romans when we get there. But the point is, everyone dies physically because they are born with a sinful nature genetic structure in their body. You age and you die because of it. All right? Now, we know in uh, physiology that in approximately uh, seven years, all the cells in your body are replaced with new cells. Some of them within uh, days, some of them weeks, months, years. But your whole body is completely new every seven years. Mine doesn't look like it. Mine doesn't look like it's a new body every seven years. Okay? Because, well, let's use scars, for example. You have a scar? Yeah. When those cells are replaced in that scar, they are replaced as scar cells. Okay? So it looks the same. How about wrinkles? Wrinkles are replaced with more wrinkle cells so that we do not get younger again. How do you think that Adam and Eve were going to live forever? They had no sinful nature in their bodies. Their bodies would renew from the nutrients that were provided in the garden. Their bodies would uh, renew new cells over and over and over again, and they would live forever. Okay. But the corruption of the sinful nature, uh, that inherited nature, causes the... Uh, body to age and die. Okay. All right, well, we'll get into a more, uh, a more detailed study of that later. 
Uh, the book of Genesis puts Adam and Eve. Oh, this is just in a little aside that I found while I was researching things. The book of Genesis puts Adam and Eve together in the Garden of Eden. But geneticists' version of the duo, the ancestors to whom the Y chromosomes, the males, and the mitochondrial DNA of the female, today's humans, can be traced, were thought to have lived tens of thousands of years apart. Science disproves the Bible. Uh, the male Y chromosome didn't start at the same time as the mitochondrial DNA of the female. Uh, they were separated by tens of thousands of years when we go back through and look at them from the geneticist uh, viewpoint. Okay, But now, two major studies of modern humans' Y chromosomes suggest that Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve may have lived around the same time after all. The Bible is not a book of science, but when it does talk about something scientific, it is always true. Okay. So back to our study. Based on the context and subsequent history, along with what we learn in Romans, we can understand the true import and meaning of the verse. Therefore, we have dying spiritually, you will begin the process of dying physically. Okay. So when we are born dead, right? We're born spiritually dead. No relationship with God. There is none good. There is none who seeks after God. Okay? Uh, we are all born phys uh, spiritually dead. That's why uh, you have scriptures that talk about being reborn, being born again, born uh, in Christ, uh, created in Christ, all of those kind of, of terms. Therefore, the translation based on grammatical and contextual rules means dying spiritually, you will, as a result, begin the process of dying physically. Therefore, we have dying spiritually, you will begin the process of dying physically. All right, so let's take a break. <laughs> and uh, oh, we didn't get as far as I thought we would. Uh, but we'll get there eventually. So let's take a 10-minute break, come back at 1110 uh, right after we pray. Father, thank you for this hour. I pray for clarity in our minds and our thinking over what we have covered and uh, that the Holy Spirit will make it, uh, make it understandable to us, uh, take out uh, any of the uh, erroneous information or explanation process that I did so that the person who has heard it will know it uh, from your point of view. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back to the second hour of our study. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to study your word and to learn the life that you have provided for us in our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're picking up now with slide uh, 29. And... That'll be a little different on your pages, but your pages don't have slide numbers, just page numbers. So uh, we'll get to uh, actually having slide numbers coming up. I've made more progress with the new system uh, that uh, I hope to start in the next week or two, depending on how the holidays go. So we're picking up here with this slide. <laughs> uh, the slide that says, 10 steps to temptation, the first sin in Genesis 3, 1 through 6, and begins with the text uh, from Young's living, uh, literal translation again. And the serpent has been more subtle above every beast of the field, which Jehovah God has made. And he says to the woman, is it true that God has said, you do not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman says unto the serpent, of the fruit of the trees of the garden we do eat, and of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you do not eat of it, nor touch it, lest you die. 
And the serpent said to the woman, Dying you do not die, for God does know that in the day of your eating of it your eyes have been opened, and you have been as God, knowing good and evil. And the woman sees that the tree is good for food, and that it's pleasant to the eyes, and the tree is desirable to make one wise, and she takes of its fruit and eats, and gives also to her husband with her, and he does eat. I expect you all have read that uh, that uh, chapter and those passages numerous times. Um, we're going to make some things stand out to you that um, may not have stood out to you the first time through. Um, Wearsby says this about the first temptation. The tempter. God is not the author of sin, nor does he tempt people to sin. Uh, this is the work of the devil. We have already seen that Satan fell into sin prior to the work of Genesis 1, uh, uh, Genesis 1, verses 3 and following. He was a beautiful angel originally rejoicing at God's creation, as recorded in Job 38, but he sinned and was judged by God, and that's found in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. He then talks about the tempter. Note that Satan came to Eve. Actually, we already started about the tempter. Uh, note that Satan came to Eve in the guise of a serpent, for he is a masquerader and never appears to people in his true character. In Genesis 3, Satan is the serpent who deceives. In Genesis 4, he is the liar that murders. We must take care to avoid his deceptive ways. Next, he talks about the target. Satan aimed at Eve's mind, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 Timothy 2, and succeeded in deceiving her. Satan uses lies. He is a liar himself and the father of lies. Take your uh, pen or pencil or whatever you use for a marking uh, device and put an underline Right there. We'll kind of be coming back to that as we come on with the, some more of these slides. The tactic. As long as the mind holds to God's truth, Satan cannot win. But once the mind doubts God's word, there is room for the devil's lies to move in. Satan questioned God's word, denied God's word, and then substituted his own lies. In verse 1, he questioned God's word. In verse 4, he denied God's word was true. And then in verse 5, he substituted his own word for God's word. Note that Satan seeks to undermine our faith in the goodness of God. He suggested to Eve that God was holding out on them by keeping them from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When we question God's goodness and doubt his love, we are playing right into the hands of Satan. Satan made the temptation sound wonderful by making an offer. You will be like God. Satan himself had wanted to be like uh, the Most High in Isaiah 14, 14. And centuries later, he offered Christ all the kingdoms of the world if he would worship him in Matthew 4, 8. The tragedy. Eve should not have given place to the devil, as it says in Ephesians 4, 27. She should have held to God's word and resisted him. We wonder where Adam was during this conversation. You can put a check mark by that. We're going to see that also. At any rate, Eve took away from God's word by omitting freely. She added to the word by adding touch it. And she changed the word by making God's you shall surely die into lest you die. So let's look at how this happens uh, after we finish up with Wearsby's quotes here. In verse 6, uh, we see the tragic operation of the lust of the flesh. She said oh, it was good for food. The lust of the eyes, pleasant to the eyes. And the pride of life, desirable to make one wise. First John 2, 15 to 17 talks about this. We're going to look at that verse at the end if we get the opportunity, depending on how much I talk during this hour. All right. Actually, we're going to look at it right now uh, briefly. Uh, this is the first, uh, this is first John 2.16, not just John 2.16. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Those are three arenas of sin. I've given you the six uh, lust patterns, the six motivators, uh, and these are the three arenas in which those take place. Uh, back to Wearsby. Uh, Wearsby says, it's difficult to sin alone. Something in us makes us want to share the sin with others, as Eve did with Adam. Adam deliberately sinned and plunged the world into judgment. 1 Timothy 2.14 is another one of those verses that gives us further information about what happened. And this is what it, uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So we know why now that Adam had to carry the sinful nature to hand it down uh, to others, uh, to the entire human race, because he was not deceived. He knew what he was doing. Man is de mankind is deceived, and women are uh, of the nature by their genetics to be more likely to be deceived, and men are more likely to do it anyway, even when they're not, okay? Those are characteristics that you can spot in a lot of people. Of course, that crosses the sex, sex division also, but that's the general tendency more and more. This from Warren Wearsby, 1993, his expository outlines on the Old Testament. Okay, so here are the 10 steps to temptation. Um, Insubordination, speculation, approximation, consideration, conversation, misquotation. And under misquotation, we have four means of misquotation. Omission, addition, substitution, and mitigation. Then we go on to the seventh, which is contradiction. Eight, misapplication. Nine, rationalization and 10, capitulation. So these probably don't make a lot of sense right now, but they will as we go through and see what each one is. By the way, go ahead and memorize these uh, now uh, before I go on to the next slide so that you'll know them all. Okay. All right, here we go. Ephesians 2, 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. This applies to all of us. Conversation here is the word for uh, manner of life, our manner of life. Uh, we all had our manner of life, our walk. Um, and... We all had it in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. All right, so let's look at insubordination. Insubordination is removing yourself from the authority and protection of divine establishment and divine assets. God has a defined, a defined divine order for things that's called divine establishment. And he has provided for us divine assets to be able to function in uh, not only the world, our physical lives, but also in our spiritual lives. Insubordination, removing yourself from the authority. Speculation. Speculation is the what ifs in our life. What if? Um, children play this game often as their brains are developing. They'll say, what if such and such? What if that? What if this? And I would always try to conclude that conversation with, with what if a meteor fell out of the sky and killed us right now? Uh, <laughs> when, when I tired of their what ifs. Okay. What ifs are letting your mind wander from God and his word to alternative scripts or frames. Those are processes of thinking that uh, in the more detailed study on this I did years ago, I... Uh, had taught about scripts and frames. We'll, we may see a little bit of that coming up in the future here. But uh, letting your mind wander from what God has said 
and speculating about an alternative, something else. What if, uh, what if, uh, what if man wrote the Bible instead of God? What if this was not really what God said? This is not what God meant, that kind of thing. Speculation. Number three, approximation. Placing yourself in a physical or mental position to be tempted. I've not put in all of the passages that uh, are biblical examples of all of these. I did leave this one in. Uh, I didn't want to, I knew I would talk a lot if I left all of them in. So just this one, Proverbs 4, 14, and 15 from the New King James. Do not enter the path of the wicked uh, and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. That's approximation. Uh, or that's a warning against approximation. Don't, don't hang out with bad people. Okay? Uh, scriptures, especially Proverbs, full of that. Full of that. Do not hang out with bad people. Uh, that's approximation. Consideration. That's a matter weighed or taken into account when formulating an opinion or a plan. You can, you, this is the, the actual thinking through the process. The what if brings up the idea. The consideration is carrying it through. Thinking how it's going to work. Coming up with a plan or an opinion. It's a, a consideration of an alternative to the word. Five is conversation. That's, that's an exchange of sentiments, observations, opinions, or ideas to discuss alternatives to God's word with the world, the flesh, or the devil. This oftentimes takes place internally. Well, what is called self-talk. Self-talk, those conversations that you have in your mind, kind of, uh, I always think of back when I uh, wanted to quit smoking, back long time ago, when I wanted to quit smoking, I would have those internal conversations. I would exchange sentiments, observations, opinions, or ideas with myself in my own mind. I'd have a carry on a conversation, it would go like this. Oh, sure, cigarette sure would be good right now. And then my mind would say, no, you're, you're trying to quit. You don't want to smoke anymore. And then uh, it would come back and say, yeah, but it sure would taste good, wouldn't it? And then I'd say, uh, no, I'm, I'm really, at this time, I'm really going to quit. I'm not going to break down and give in this time like I have all the other times. Uh, and then I would come, could come back and say, yeah, but boy, you just had that delicious dinner and now you're having a cup of coffee and boy, a cigarette and a cup of coffee. Boy, wouldn't that be good, okay? Uh, and then my uh, other side of my mind would come back and say, okay, where are the cigarettes? <laughs> uh, now, uh, fortunately, I was able to uh, overcome that conversation and uh, in that conversation and not smoke again thereafter. Okay, so, but that's the kind of conversation that we're talking about. It can be internal like that, or it can be external, talking to someone else, like college kids who grew up in a Christian home and went to church on a regular basis, unfortunately didn't learn much, and then they go off to college and conversation with other students or with uh, faculty members uh, then turns them against the idea of God being God and the Word being the Word. Number six, misquotation. To inaccurately repeat a passage, or to inaccurately re repeat anything for that matter, but in our discussion, a passage of Scripture. And there are four ways we do that. We omit something. We don't, uh, we don't uh, mention it, or we leave it out in writing, whatever. Uh, secondly, substitution. The act of putting in or placing uh, or using something in the place of another. We substitute what uh, the Bible says. Addition, the act or process of adding something. And uh, then mitigation, to lessen the effects of. 
to mitigate something is to lessen the effects of. Then we move on to contradiction, to assert the contrary of something, to take issue with it. Number eight, misapplication, an act of misapplying, to erroneously put into operation or effect, to, to misapply. Number nine, rationalization, to attribute one's actions to rational and creditable motives without analysis of true and especially unconscious motives. To attribute one's actions to rational and creditable motives. Number 10, capitulation, the act of surrendering or yielding. So let's look at all 10 of these uh, and uh, see them in context here. Let's first uh, reread the, the verse, the, the passage. And the serpent has been subtle, crafty above every beast of the field, which Jehovah God had made. And he said unto the woman, is it true that God has said you do not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, of the trees, of the fruit of the trees of the garden we do eat, and of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you do not eat it nor touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Dying you do not die, for God does know that in the day of your eating of it, your eyes will have been opened, and you will have been as God, knowing good and evil. And the woman sees that the tree is good for food, that it's pleasant to the eyes, and the tree is desirable to make one wise, and she takes of its fruit and eats, and gives also to her husband with her, and he does eat. All right, so let's look at each section here. In verse 1 of chapter 3, and the serpent uh, has been more subtle or crafty above every beast of the field. Well, immediately we read that the serpent here was not a snake, uh, as he's depicted in the, the uh, photographs of the time back when uh, uh, somebody took photographs of the garden and we see Adam and Eve and the snake together. Uh, the serpent was a beast of the field. That means he had four legs. Uh, he was created by God, and he said to the woman, is it true that God has said, you do not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, this is kind of a tricky, tricky question here, a trick question. But uh, first of all, note that uh, Eve does not appear to be at all shocked that the, that the serpent spoke to her. Um, uh, it may have been that they communicated with the animals. Uh, I've been informed that we will communicate with animals in heaven when we die, and, and our animals will be there. And I, I'm not going to contradict that statement in any manner, not going to have a conversation about it or anything, because I don't want to uh, face the consequences. So he said, is it true that God has said? So what's the first thing? Question, a questioning. You do not, uh, uh, God say, you do not eat of every tree of the garden. So in verse 1, we find consideration and conversation. Consider this, Satan is saying in effect. Uh, as God said, you do not get to eat every tree in the garden. And of course, it's done in conversation. But before the serpent said anything, we saw insubordination. Uh, Isha was not with God or with her man, the only two she could have rapport with. So she was out of divine uh, establishment. Uh, she should have been with Adam or should have been with uh, God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ in the garden. Uh, should not have been uh, wandered off by herself, removing herself from the authority and protection. And before the serpent said anything, she was near the tree. Okay? She was near the tree, standing there looking at it. If she wasn't speculating about it, not a what if. Okay? If she hadn't been thinking what if about the tree, she probably would not have been standing there around it. She may have started her what if from some distance away from the tree, and every day or so when the opportunity arose, she may have gotten a little bit closer to the tree to see what it looked like. 
to see it again, to see that this tree is different. There's something about it. Speculation. Uh, she was at the tree. That's approximation, placing yourself in physical or mental position to be tempted. She was there. She was at the tree. So now let's, uh, let's compare what God said to what uh, Esha said, what Eve said. Uh, in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, here's what God said. And Jehovah God lays a charge on the man saying, of every tree of the garden eating, you eat freely. And of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you do not eat of it. For in the day of your eating of it, dying, you will die. All right, so compare that with the right-hand column where Isha makes her report in verse 2. And the woman says unto the serpent, of the fruit of the trees of the garden we do eat. And of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you do not eat of it nor touch it, lest you die. So let's analyze and see. You can see some obvious differences. God said, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. Esau said, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. She, in this conversation, misquoted God. She left something out. What did she leave out? Freely. You may eat freely. God said, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Esha said, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you should not eat from it or touch it. Whoa, so here she has substituted. See, God called it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Esha called it the tree in the middle of the garden. Do you think she knew where it was? Do you think that that was a foremost thought in her mind, which tree? And do you think that she uh, substituted that for the knowledge of good and evil? Because obviously God has taught them every afternoon. Uh, there was a uh, visitation from the second person of the Trinity that we know as Jesus Christ would come into the garden and have Bible study every afternoon with them and talk to them and teach them about things. And so she had, a, she had knowledge. She had knowledge of these things. So she calls it the tree in the middle of the garden instead, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then she says, uh, you should not eat from it or touch it, she says, is what God said. Did God say that? You shall not eat. Doesn't say anything about touching it, but she did. She added to God's word. She substituted for what God said to, to uh, make it sound a little better, and she added something to it to make it a little easier. God said, for in the day that you eat from it, dying you will die. Esha said, lest you die. The word lest uh, means uh, for fear that. It's used after an expression denoting fear or apprehension, uh, like uh, worried lest she should be late. Uh, the woman was worried lest she be late. It means uh, for fear that you would be late or for fear that anything. So, so Isha has said here, taking God's dying, you will die, which is a pretty solid declarative statement. She says, uh, you might die. You might die, because you might die, okay? Not you will die, but you might die. So this is, again, Eve's uh, misquotation. She substituted, and she mitigated. She lessened the penalty for the offense. Uh, dying, you will die, or you might die. For worrying that you might die. Right? So... Eve was vulnerable to this suggestion because she distorted the word of God. She omitted freely and added to it or touch it. And she changed it lest you die instead of you will die. In her reply to Satan's question, she perverted and misquoted three times the divine law 
to which she and Adam were subject. She disparaged her privileges by misquoting the terms of the divine permission as to the other trees. You may eat all of them freely. She overstated the restrictions by misquoting the divine prohibition. Okay? You can't even touch it. And she underrated her obligations by misquoting the divine penalty, dying you shall die. Uh, William Griffith uh, Thomas says uh, uh, in his commentary on uh, a devotional commentary, God reveals his character through his word. When we do not retain his word precisely, a distorted concept of God is the result. That led Eve to got, doubt God's goodness. Here's another one of those little uh, highlights. For you, because that's going to be part of the importance of this. All right, now the serpent elevates the game. The serpent said to the woman in verse 4, You surely will not die. No, he said, Dying you will not die. Eve said, You might die. Satan got it right. In the actual Hebrew, he says, dying, you will not die. He knew exactly what God said. All right. Uh, then the contradiction, that is the contradiction, and then the misapplication. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you would be like God, knowing good and evil. Is that true? Yeah, Satan didn't lie here. God certainly knew that their eyes would be open and that they would be like God, knowing good and evil. In fact, God says so later. Um, that's a misapplication of the scriptures, of the passage, God's word. In verse 6, the woman said, when the woman, or the, well, this is what the woman did, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she rationalized. Well, you know, uh, worry that you might die, but man, it looks good. Uh, it's beautiful. And it could make me wise like God. That's a rationalization. And then here are those three arenas again. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. The world offers only the lust for physical pleasure, the lust for everything we see, and the pride in ourselves. These are not from the Father. They are from this evil world. The flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life. There is the lust of the flesh. The flesh, the physical body, not the inherited genetic human nature from Adam in this case, but the true flesh being distinguished from the eyes and the pride of life in this passage suggests the pleasures of the body. What makes it feel better or happy? That's the sexual and chemical lust. Makes the body feel better. Sex and chemistry. Uh, the, the, uh, there is the lust of the eyes. The eyes are delighted with treasures, riches, and rich possessions are craved by an extravagant eye. This is the lust of covetousness, and it follows the lust pattern of materialism. Of my six, those are the, my six areas of happiness, happiness motivators, all right? And then there's the pride of life. A vain mind craves all the grandeur, adulation, and success of a glorious life. This is ambition and thirst after honor and applause. Uh, this is, in effect, a disease of the ear. It must be flattered with admiration and praise. Here are the lust patterns involved with it. Approbation, of course, power, and religion. The woman did and the man did. Capitulation, step 10. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Have you seen, as an example, uh, couples in, in a setting where the woman is talking and 
she really doesn't have it correct, but the man just sits there and lets it go on because he doesn't want to interrupt, he doesn't want to be rude, he doesn't want to correct her. Uh, you've seen situations like that uh, in your uh, social gatherings, and so I kind of picture it like that, that Adam was there, but he really didn't have anything he wanted to interject at that time. So he ate it when Eve gave it to him. And it says he was with her, not she had to go get him and give it to him to eat it. He was there. Now, some say that this was an act of grace on his part, that knowing that she dying would die, that he chose to eat it and die and die so that she would not be all alone, but that, that he could still care for her. Don't know what's true. That's all speculation on our part, uh, but uh, there's a possibility. The capitulation, they gave in, they ate it. So here are the 10 steps in subordination, being out of authority, speculation, the what ifs, the approximation, putting yourself in a position to be tempted. Putting yourself in a position to be tempted. I've probably told this story to this, to this group, uh, but at least some of you may have heard it. Uh, the fellow that went to the preacher and he said, preacher, I really want to quit drinking. He said, I can't control myself. I get drunk. Every time I take the first drink, I cannot stop and I get drunk. And the preacher said, well, I heard this Bible study about approximation, and uh, where is it that you drink? And he said, oh, down at Joe's Bar. And he said, Joe's Bar? He said, oh, yeah, that's my, been my favorite place for years and years and years. That's where I always go to drink. And the preacher said, well, when do you go to Joe's Bar? And he said, oh, every day after work. He said, it's like a magnet. It pulls me over to his bar and, and, and pulls me in. He said, I just can't seem to fight it. And the preacher said, well, he said, uh, do you have to walk by Joe's bar after work every day or could you take another route? And the fellow said, oh, yeah, another route would be easy. He said, it's six blocks out of my way to go past Joe's bar. So he approximated himself to the temptation. He walked six blocks out of his way to get to the place where he was tempt tempted, just as Eve placed herself in front of the tree that was her, for her temptation. Consideration, running it through her mind. Ah, it's good looking. It looks great. It's a, uh, well, it's a beautiful tree. Uh, we, we, we get to have all the other trees. Why can't we have this one? Conversation. She had the conversation with uh, Satan. She uh, talked about it in her own mind and with him. Uh, then she misquoted. She left things out. She added things in. She substituted for what God said. And she mitigated uh, the, uh, the uh, consequences. Uh, step seven, contradictions. Satan said, you dying, you will not die. Contradiction. Misapplication. Well, you know, it is. Uh, this would be good to be like God. You know, I, then we'd have something to say at Bible class every afternoon in the cool of the day when God comes around and talks to us. Uh, we could actually have something we could contribute to the conversation. You know, if we were like God, we'd know all that stuff. And then, uh, and then last of all, it's, it looks good, good for food, beautiful, make me wise. I'll rationalize that into capitulation. So then capitulation. All right. So what should we learn from the 10 steps? At any point in this process, we can recognize that we are involved in it and remove ourselves immediately. Okay. Approximation is the easiest one. Put yourself in, uh, in a uh, location or a conversation, a, a book, a website, uh, anything like that that could serve as a 
means of temptation to you, at that point you can say, this is interesting, but this is not godly. Therefore, I'm leaving it. I'm leaving the website. I'm leaving the, the I'm, I'm not going to watch the movie. I'm not going to read the book any further. I'm not going to do anything. This is not godly. Uh, this is a potential uh, to tempt me. Uh, and you can feel that. You can feel that. You, your weaknesses in your inherited genetic human nature from Adam, uh, you know what they are, or you will know. Uh, and you'll say, because when you're uh, approximated to something like that, it's like your sinful nature goes, ah, yeah. Yeah, this is, oh yeah, this is good. This is good. Uh, it's, it's like, yeah, I, I like that. It's, it's, it's a good thing. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Uh, but the Holy Spirit uh, will bring to mind your Bible knowledge, that spiritual wisdom, that insight that comes from studying the Word of God, and you'll say, ah, maybe I should leave this alone. Maybe I should leave this alone. Have you noticed um, in movies, and, well, let's just leave it at movies. This happened in television shows also. How much foul language there is. How much bad language there is. And uh, I can guarantee you that if you watch those movies repeatedly, you will start thinking those words those words will pop into your mind, into your thoughts. And you may only say them inside, not say them out loud, but those words will begin to become a part of your vocabulary in your own mind. Uh, that's an example of how this works. The more you expose yourself to something um, that feeds on those six happiness motivators, uh, either the good side or the bad side, the easier it becomes to uh, become part of that, to let it become part of you. So in any point in the process, whether it be uh, insubordination, you know, how's, your, how's your Bible uh, study going? Are you, are you constantly uh, learning something from the Word? Are you constantly... Uh, being reminded of what it says. I'm going to bring something out here that uh, had you make some, some marks in your notes. Places where it talks about deceived. Either the commentator mentioned that Eve was deceived or Eve said she was deceived. The actual Hebrew word for that says, made me forget. Made me forget. Made me forget. She had the Word of God given to her every day in the afternoon when God came down and spoke with Adam and Isha and discussed things with them. She knew, but the way it was presented to her made her forget. And that happens to us in approximation, in, in uh, consideration, and conversation, and all of those areas where we can be uh, on that path to temptation, that happens to us. We forget. We put it out of our mind. Instead of it, instead of it saying, ah, instead of, uh, yeah, let's do it.
Yeah, let's do it. Oops, <laughs> that's a U. Will not die. Let's just use that bad translation, but but uh, use that. When Satan said that, what should have happened in E's thinking? That's not what God says. God didn't say that. God said dying will die. And that would have been a point to shut it off. No, that's that's a lie. That's not true. That's how we should understand it. That the situations, the conversations, uh, the entertainment, all of those things will make you forget. And you could say later, and you probably have later, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I should, you know, that's not, that's not God's way. That's not what God says. That's not what the Word says. Uh, but at the moment, because of the way things are presented, see, that's why it says Satan was more subtle, crafty than any of the beasts of the field. He knew how to play on Eve's thinking and get her to forget momentarily what God had said. So, that's another point at which we can do that, where we can see that we might be involved in that the 10 steps of temptation. All right, so I'm going to give you a quick version of the three elements of resisting temptation. Uh, this is from James 1. Remember, that's where we started <laughs> before we took off into Genesis to see an example. So, step one, understanding the mechanics of temptation. There are mechanics of temptation. God is an orderly, orderly, very specific and orderly God. Uh, when you read His Word and you see the perfection in the way things are laid out, you will see that He is very orderly. Uh, everything is very rational. It is very logical. It all fits through. And so there is a mechanic, a mechanical process involved in temptation that he has given us to understand. Secondly, identifying temptation when it happens by knowing sin categorization. And that's why I like the various means of sin categorization. Uh, you can use the lust of the eyes, uh, the, lust, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Use those three. Uh, until you have a better understanding of the six, uh, but the six aren't that hard to get in generalities. And so you know the categorization of sin. You can identify when something is coming up that's one of those. Okay? And then thirdly, the capability of resisting through biblical alternative thinking. Um, you can use an alternative thought process called biblical alternative thinking to uh, resist. All right, so here are the mechanics. James 1.14. We covered them earlier. We're going to review them here quickly. Each one is tempted when he's carried away by his own desires and enticed. Each one, akastos, each individual. You have your own individual temptation pattern. It may not be the same as a family members or a friend's, you have your own individual uh, temptation pattern because you have your own desire patterns, your own weakness patterns. Should it be uh, chemical, religious, approbation, um, materialism, power, uh, sex, whatever it is, you have a weakness area. All right? So you have your own individual one and you receive a solicitation to do evil. You receive it from the world, the flesh, or the devil. Those three. The world will provide the temptation in, like we talked about, books, uh, magazines, uh, television, movies, uh, internet, whatever. Those are uh, uh, areas where the solicitation can take place. A solicitation to do evil. When you're carried away, taken in tow, pulled, 
under the authority of your own personal lust pattern. See, one of those six, and uh, it's going to be, and one of those six is going to be pulling you, your sinful nature will use one of those six to pull you towards something, to tow you, okay? Uh, and you're enticed. There's bait. Might be a beautiful woman. Might be a, a, uh, somebody's wallet lying, lying on the ground that you can pick up, put in your pocket, and take whatever is in it. It might be any kind of bait, but there will be some sort of bait there for you to see and to uh, be attracted to, drawn to, just like an animal drawn to a baited trap. So what did we see in Genesis 3, temptation, that relates back to what we learned in James 1.14? Well, let's start with the easy one. What was the bait? What was the bait? The tree. The fruit of the tree. Okay. What was the desire? Right. Make her wise. Wise. Okay. But was there an own authority of desire, like in the, in the James uh, formula that we saw, towed along by your own authority of desire, your own authority of the lust pattern? Did she have that? Did she have that? Did, was, that was that towing Eve? Well, no, because Eve was innocent. She had no authority of desire yet. She had no sinful nature to pull her. Okay. She did not receive that authority, that sinful nature authority, until she committed the first sin. The first then corrupted her body, as we saw in Romans 5. The fruit they ate caused a change in their cellular structure, which not only gave them a new authority inside them, it it, we learned, would be passed down from generation to generation. It's genetic. She did not have it at that time. Since Eve had no authority of desire, we can study the passage to see the pattern of the first temptation. Part of it is internal in her, in Eve, in her innocence. And part of it was external from the serpent and the tree. But all of it came together to form a common, almost universal pattern of temptation for all human beings since. Okay? So this, uh, you have to, with your notes, or if you downloaded them and printed them from uh, your uh, email, you have uh, a page that looks like this. And this is a temptation sequence and uh, that I have used in teaching a lot of things. But first thing, there is an event. Something takes place. In Eve's case, the serpent shows up and talks to her. Okay? The event. She perceives the event. She recognizes that, that something's going on here. And then we appraise the event. We appraise it. And, and uh, you saw scripts and frames uh, in an earlier slide. That's part of the appraisal process. There are a set of filters that we use to appraise things uh, and uh, that uh, go through that appraisal process to uh, look at things. We do it from knowledge, our mood, our memory, our uh, uh, things, our, our understanding of how things work. We have all of these different factors um, that I, uh, I still remember the acronym, CATLIP. Uh, what well, was the uh, acronym? I can't remember all of the individuals, uh, but I mentioned some of them. We appraise what's going on. We think it through. We think it through. We, we take it through our thought process uh, 
And, and you'll, you'll recognize that because sometimes you'll hear uh, people say, I did it without thinking. Okay? I did it without thinking. They didn't appraise the situation. They just saw, perceived it, and they did it without even appraising the situation. There's a scripture in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 that says, he who is spiritual appraises all things. Or as some people say it, he who judges is spiritual. Uh, no, he who is spiritual appraises all things. So a regular human has, has the cat lip, and I'll uh, have to remind myself what, the, what those stand, all of those stand for. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to bother, bother to try to figure it out now. But you think it through. And then after they think it through, they come up with a representation. A representation is, this is my conclusion, okay? The conclusion of the thinking process. And in the case of a temptation, let's make this a temptation representation. We then go to that volitional interlude where we have to decide. And we can uh, choose, back in the day that I made this, I called it the inherited sin nature of Adam. Okay, We can have the inherited sin nature of Adam reaction and say, yep, I'm taking that temptation and I'm going with it. Or <coughs> we can have the spiritual response and that will result in either carnality. Carnality is the is walking by means of the flesh, spirituality walking by means of the spirit. Now, this is only possible in believers. Notice that in the appraisal process, uh, it's for all humans. They don't have scripture. They don't have the Holy Spirit. In the believer's appraisal process, we add the word and the spirit. That's why uh, the scripture says they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? okay, we have to have the word and the spirit, and that changes our appraisal process so that we have a spiritual response. The unbeliever only has the sinful nature, the human nature response, either good, human good, or human bad. They can go human good, they can go human bad. They can see the wallet, stick it in their pocket without anybody seeing it, go home and count the money. Or they can pick the wallet up and they can take it over to the counter and say, someone dropped this, hopefully they'll come by to claim it later. Okay, The good or the bad response. Okay, But that's all the unbeliever has. Okay, unbeliever, didn't leave myself enough room. Okay, but the believer has a choice. Can go either way. Can go either way. All right, just about. Okay. Remember the set, the six. Uh, this is a, another way I group them called scrap them. S C R A P uh, M, scrap them. Uh, the other way I put it was C R A M P S, cramps because they put a cramp in your spiritual walk. They adversely affect your spiritual walk. So I like cramps, but scrap them also uh, fits because get rid of them. You know, as soon as one comes up in that process of appraisal, then cast it aside. Say no, no. It's called resisting. All right, so here's... Uh, the temptation source number one, the world. Uh, in the arena of the flesh, you'll see the sexual propensity pattern or the chemical propensity pattern. That's the body, the flesh. In the arena of the eyes, you'll have materialism. Okay? In the arena of the pride of life, you'll find religion, approbation, and power. Those three areas in the pride of, uh, form the pride of life. 
what I believe, how, what, what governs the way I think, my desire for approval and admiration, my uh, desire to be in charge. Okay? And then you have the same thing from uh, the uh, flesh, uh, the second chart you have like that, and then you have the devil. And all of those temptations will come in those areas based on where the source comes from, the world, the flesh, or the devil. Okay? Now here's the amalgamated version of that chart where you will have them. And I may have put in here. Yeah, I did. Okay. Temptation to sin. Against God or against your neighbor, you know? Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can sin against either of those. Okay? And this is the process. This is temptation to sin, the flesh, the devil, the world. You can see that process. Memorize this for the quiz next week. Be able to fill in all of the boxes and discuss them uh, in a few short pages. Uh, well, never mind. No, that's not, that's not it. That's what's going to happen when you get to heaven, though, right? And you just imagine, I said, uh, did you know I had a word? Call it the Bible. You call it the Bible, which means a book. Yeah? Yeah. You ever read it? Yeah. I looked at it. Yeah. Uh, okay, draw me a diagram of the uh, three sources of sin. Oh, we won't have to do that. We will. We'll be just like him. We'll see him as he is. We'll. Oh man, not because I wanted to help grade the tests, you know. Because, not no. That's my power. <laughs> that's my power. My power motivation. I want to grade the test, and I want to point out everyone that got it wrong. Okay, uh, joking aside now. <laughs> okay, so those ten steps. Um, you, you study them some. Uh, go back through Genesis and see them in, in the context of where they are uh, in the slides where I went through each part of it, what God said, what Esau said, what Satan said. Uh, that'll help you to get the idea. You don't have to, uh, to be able to use the term uh, exactly. Uh, it works better if you do. Like if I'm involved in a process of temptation, uh, and, and uh, not smart enough to get uh, the insubordination, speculation, or approximation, because those are the easiest ones, okay? Uh, then I might not pick it up until a little further on in, that, uh, in those steps. And uh, so it's good to know them, but just to know that they exist and uh, that it, can, it will come to mind that, oh, wait a minute, this isn't right. Uh, even if you can't say, oh, this is, this is misapplication, uh, as long as you know it's not right. That's all you need to say. The magic words. Magic word sentence begins with I, because idios, we each have our own individual. I resist that. I reject that. Okay? Easiest three words to be able to stop the temptation process. I resist that. Okay? And next week, I'll show you what to do after you resist it, how you carry on the next step to make it easier. Actually, I'm going to give it to you now because I hate to leave you behind. And then comes rehearse. Okay. See, you've seen reckon. Now you're seeing today resist temptation. And the next is rehearse. And that's rehearse the scriptures that apply. 
run through your mind the scriptures that solidify your choice to resist that temptation. What that temptation was about and what God has to say about it. You rehearse those scriptures and just like that, it's gone. Okay, It's gone. may come back again tomorrow, but if you keep rehearsing the scriptures, uh, keep resisting and rehearsing, uh, reckoning, resisting, and the rehearsing, uh, then that area of temptation in your life will go away. It will go away. Now, you may have to face it uh, in another time frame in a little different manner because that's how we keep growing in our spiritual life, but uh, re reckon, resist, and rehearse. Those are the ways. All right, let's pray, and we'll close for today. Father, we're grateful that you have given us spiritual wisdom, that you've given us insight into your eternal purpose. Uh, the eternal purpose in Christ have placed us in Christ so that we are a part of it, so that we might be a source of showing to the principalities and powers in heavenly places the manifold wisdom that you have provided for us to be able to live this life. We thank you for it, we love you, and we uh, bless you in the name of our Lord, Yahusha HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior. Amen.